I've heard that Minecraft is a creative sandbox, a game that gives you the freedom to do whatever you like. Build whatever you want to build and have fun in whatever way suits you. So why do I see lots of endgame players all doing the same thing? Crafting the same tools and armor, building the same farms everyone else has, and feel like they are forced to play the game in a certain way in order to have that fun? Well, Minecraft is an old game. With now over 20 major updates, a lot has changed since it was originally released. As fun and exciting new features have always been added, it can become increasingly difficult to keep track of everything the game has to offer, and sometimes things are just forgotten about. Although usually this has smaller ramifications, where potentially cool items become useless, or things just don't work the way you'd expect them to, sometimes it can have more devastating effects, creating an unbalanced mess of the core mechanics of the game that almost every player has to deal with, solidifying the meta for every player to follow as any deviation from this path is putting you at a disadvantage, taking away from the spirit of Minecraft's sandbox nature and fundamentally changing the way the game is played. <sighs> Trying to balance all these complex mechanics that interact with one another in an interesting way to promote creativity while not taking away from the player's fun experience is an extremely difficult task, and a little harder than your average cookie clicker clone. When people claim that mending is overpowered, you have to ask, in what way? Did it only recently become unbalanced due to changes in the game or how players used it? How much is it going to affect gameplay? What ideas do you have that could fix it? And although I've heard ideas from just make your tools not break to removing it entirely, I've had my own ideas from removing it from the villager trading pool or making it mutually exclusive to unbreaking. But not only are these ideas just unfun restrictions placed just for the sake of balance, I feel like these are just band-aid solutions to a symptom of a much larger and deeper issue. But no matter our best efforts, not everything will be the same as it was before. Diamonds will probably never be as valuable as they once were, we will never not be able to fly with the elytra, and the balancing costs for some items that were removed will never go back to what they once were. But that doesn't mean we can still try to patch the mistakes that are plaguing this game, add new creative cost to items to try and balance the playing field, and give the future of Minecraft a hope, a chance to be better. My name is Greenjab, and I have some ideas that can hopefully fix Minecraft. When enchanting was added back in release 1.0, it was expensive, extremely limited, and very situational. After using our precious diamonds on an enchanting table, we meticulously grinded to level 50, which was much harder back then due to the limited mechanics at the time and shallower understanding of the game overall. We put our item into the slot, repeatedly until level 50 showed up, and pressed the button. We did not know what we would get. We would not keep any of those 50 levels, there was no mending, no repairing, no grindstone or combining. What you got is what you got, and you prayed you got something good. It was something where using a few levels, you could enhance your gear a bit, a protection 1 here, sharpness 3 there, and perhaps even a fortune 2 if you were lucky. Since there was no way to combine in items and enchants, it was literally impossible to get fully enchanted gear. It was easy to get a small buff, harder to get a stronger buff, and every slight increase became harder and harder to obtain. And that's before you consider that, that these tools would not last forever due to their durability. It was seen as a late game optional grind for those who really wanted to invest the time into it. A solid foundation for what in the enchanting system could be. Next came probably the block that players have the most love-hate relationship with. With a hefty, at the time, cost of 3 iron blocks and 4 ingots, not to mention the first, and still one of the only blocks with durability, 1.3 brought along the anvil. With its two main functions, apart from being able to stealthily kill people from above or make funny rainbow sheep, is being able to repair items with the cost of its base material and some XP, or to be able to combine items and their newly added enchanted books to get not only more enchants on a single item, but also reach new higher levels of enchants that you could not normally obtain from the enchanting table alone, allowing you to craft what was called God Gear. 
However, to continue to prevent your tools and armor from living forever and preventing them from becoming too powerful, there was another hidden additional cost, the anvil use, which doubled every time you used that item in an anvil. And if the total cost reached the arbitrary value of 40, then that was it. This one mechanic, although worked well enough at the time and had a good enough reason for being there as it was, I believe the way it currently functions is the reason the foundation of which all enchanting lies on is damaged, the reason why enchanting feels so broken today. Being able to enchant books, and especially later renew them with the grindstone, you no longer needed to risk your precious tools being wasted with bad enchantments via offloading all the enchanting to the books and only apply the ones you want later. And when villagers could sell any and every book and see what it is before even buying it, meant that sometimes now the best way to enchant your gear was to not use the enchanting table at all, especially post 1.14. The addition of mending allowed for infinite repairability without the cost of the base material, and uses XP instead of levels, which makes mending cheaper, all at the cost of two levels. Although Mojang attempted to balance this via it being considered treasure and not being available from the enchanting table, all this did was drive people to rely on villagers even more so. Since then, we have gotten two more treasure enchants, Soul Speed from Bastions and Bartering, and Swift Snake from Ancient City Chests, both of which were not added to the villager trading pool. This means that the only non-renewable enchant in the game is Swift Snake. But if any enchantment were to be the non-renewable one, should it not be the one that makes your gear renewable? I digress. So, if one of the two main functions of the anvil has been completely replaced since anvil repairing is worse in every way, what about the other one, combining enchants together? As the system currently works, the hidden anvil usage count on the resulting item is the higher of the two input items plus one. It didn't take long for some to realize that the best way to combine enchantments was not in a linear fashion, but in the form of a binary tree. So instead of incentivizing slowly becoming more powerful over time as you add enchants one by one until you hit the level cap, the game incentivizes, almost forces you to add all the enchantments in one go. And not only that, using this method you can add all the enchantments an item has even before reaching that level 40 cap. Meaning the reason the cap was there in the first place, to prevent items from getting too powerful, has been completely circumnavigated, leaving the anvil in the broken mess that it is today. Enchanting is no longer a cool and mysterious bonus you can add to your base gear, but has become an exact science of villagery rolling, XP farming, grinding, and binary treeing. Things which people don't like to do, but feel they must do to get good. Sure, you don't need soul speed on your boots, but just because you can add it, you reach a mentality where you feel like you have to, otherwise you don't have the max gear and thus are weaker than you could be. So, how do we fix this? What can we change that will fix all of these problems while keeping to the original intent of the anvil? How do we make it simple enough for players to understand, yet complicated enough for emerging gameplay? Powerful enough to be a viable option, yet not completely overshadow alternative mechanics? What sort of buffs should we provide to counter the nerfs that will be applied so the entire Minecraft community doesn't hate it? Basically, how do we make it good? It's a tough question to answer, and probably why we haven't already had a fix already. Due to Minecraft's sandbox nature and interwebbed mechanics, it can be hard to balance these sort of features in a creative way, and I can understand why sometimes it is the way it is. But I believe I have an idea. Let's first remove the exponential hidden anvil usage cost, and also remove the whole notion of the target and sacrifice item which usually just leads to confusion and instead make it so that XP cost is purely based on the output item, regardless of what the input items are. You don't pay the XP cost of putting an enchantment on an item just when you first apply it, but rather every time that item is used in the anvil. As you add more enchants to an item, the more expensive it will be. Repairing stronger items will have a higher cost, however it won't get more expensive with every repair. I would argue, however, to keep the anvil cap. 
However, modify it so it doesn't feel like some arbitrary value of 40, but instead make it feel a little more like items can only hold so much enchanting power, which could be showcased as a bar on the side of the Anvil UI. If you try to go over that limit, it shows the bar as being above the line to represent too much. This will prevent items from being able to get all the enchantments on it, but I say this is a good thing. Suddenly, the game goes from being about trying to get every enchantment just because you can, to where you pick what enchantments you want to put on your items. For example, you could put fortune and efficiency on your pickaxe, but at the cost of leaving no room to apply unbreaking or mending. Speaking of mending, if we give mending a higher cost than 2, this will fix a large problem that mending has. Since you have to choose which enchantments you want, you can choose to put mending on your gear, but at the cost of not being able to put other enchantments on it. Alternatively, if you could put those enchants on it, but be forced to use the anvil to repair it, which, based on these changes, would be a more viable option than it was before. It's all about your playstyle and your choices. A playstyle choice could be to put less protection on your boots, but put more agility enchantments on it, so that when you are in a PvP fight and you get low, you have more chance of being able to escape your enemy who opted for the protection over the agility. Since there is no regard for how many times an item has been used in an anvil, it will better allow you to take your gear from mid-game to late-game as you can slowly upgrade your gear over time as you find more enchantments to apply to it. And since the XP cap works differently, you will have more freedom over the order the enchantments show on your items instead of whatever binary tree worked best. With the current experimental villager changes, Many did not like that they didn't sell max level enchantments, but here it could be a bonus, as you might only want sharpness 4 if it meant putting another level of sweeping edge on your sword, but if you want a high level you can combine them with little cost. It would also allow Mojang the freedom to add more enchantments to the game without worrying about players getting even more overpowered, as instead of it being another enchantment required to get max gear, it's another choice, another possible playstyle opening. Now, as different items have a different amount of enchantments, they will have to have a different amount of enchanting power they can hold. So items which can only have unbreaking or mending, like the elytra, will have to have a lower amount than those of more, like the sword. Also, the different levels of enchants should be scaled differently, like sharpness 5 should be around 1.5 times the cost of sharpness 4 instead of just one level more, which would better give the idea of choosing more lower level enchantments or a few higher ones. But there could also be some more fun modifications to this, like gold items making the enchants cheaper so you could get more on before reaching that limit, or just remove the limit entirely for them so it's possible to get max gear, albeit on gold gear. Also, as there is now a better way to limit enchants, you could remove a lot of the mutual exclusive restrictions, so if you want infinity and mending on your bow, you can, but potentially at the cost of not having a higher power level. Although some, like Silk Touch and Fortune, which actually contradict each other, will have to stay. An additional change I would add would be to buff the alternative protections. Remove their 80% damage cap so that if you have at least 13 points across your armor, not including normal protection, you can reach 100% immunity to that type of damage, leading to new interesting gameplay. Having full projectile protection would encourage you to keep a distance from your foes as their ranged attacks would have no effect on you, but if they get close to you, their melee weapon would be doing more damage to you than if you had normal protection. On top of everything else, this would encourage making multiple sets of gear for different scenarios, instead of just having the one set to rule them all. You can use the relatively new armor trims to differentiate between your sets, like red trims for your fire protection set and use armor stands to display these sets. Then you can use the new armor swapping mechanic to quickly change between your sets of armor, but it would be nice if we could place items in the hands of the armor stand though. We could even add over enchanted items as rare loot that will have more enchantments than normal or even higher level than max level enchantments like sharpness 6. However, as they will be over the enchanting limit and will not have mending, there will be no way to modify or repair it bringing back powerful yet situational items as you have to be careful when you use it or it will break. Give it a different enchanting glint, so that if you ever encounter a player with this new glint, you know they are bringing out the big guns. 
helping you to decide whether or not to flee, or to get out your own and attempt to acquire theirs. Sure, there will have to be some testing and balancing over how much does each enchant cost, and how much enchanting power can each item hold, but compared to the old system, anything would be better. I would suggest a top-down approach for enchants, where instead of Mending and Sharpness 1 being around the same level since they are both level 1, have Mending closer to Sharpness 5 since they are both the max level, and scale down from there. If you really wanted, you could have the difficulty affect the scaling so that you can fit more enchants on easy and less on hard. Another option is to possibly have a way to increase the amount of enchantments an item can have over time but I wouldn't want it to be something you can just make a farm once for and just have better gear from there on, as we would be back at square one. Regardless, I believe this is the fix to anvils that enchanting needs to be loved again, to make it interesting, engaging, and balanced, to make it good again. So, if we have solved one of the largest parts plaguing survival Minecraft, what about another one? Transport. Although there are many forms of it, I'm sure most of you only use one on a regular basis. It's faster than a speeding boat, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings with a single boost. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, wait, we don't have those in Minecraft. It must be the Elytra. The Elytra is the strongest form of transport being one of the fastest, the most agile, doesn't need any pre-built setup, doesn't die of fall damage, in fact stops you from taking fall damage, has minimal usage cost, and something you can easily carry with you, all with the downside of a little less protection and being locked behind Minecraft's not so late, late game. There is a reason why no one seems to make large railway systems anymore, apart from those piston bolts and juries who usually situate themselves on the nether roof. The Elytra was introduced in the controversial 1.9 update, which fundamentally changed the way we play Minecraft. Not just with regards to combat, but back then the Elytra was still just a glider. Jump from a great height then glide down to the ground. Its benefits to its trade-off, taking over the chestplate slot, was more of a balanced choice. But, as always, it didn't take long for people to find a way to exploit its behaviour in the form of a punch to bow. Although tricky to perform, with some practice, some players were able to attain the power of infinite flight at the cost of literally hitting themselves over and over again to gain speed. So, two updates later in 1.11, Mojang made a choice that would forever change Minecraft by turning it into an intended mechanic by the very cheaply renewable firework rockets, a very much beloved mechanic by the community. Being able to fly infinitely by pressing right click every now and again, launch into the sky without needing to jump off a cliff, escape almost any situation with ease and so much more made the Elytra so powerful that ever since then all other forms of transportation and all chest plates have been left to be forgotten about. People claim that exploration is boring, even with the 1.18 mountains, but with the Elytra, exploration has effectively become a waiting game for the next chunk to load. You do not need to interact with the terrain at all now as you would just fly over at speed and only look at your coordinates. Any adventure has now just become about the destination rather than the journey. Recently, Mojang did try to rectify the situation by tweaking the Elytra such that rocket boosting was slower and the Elytra only used up durability while boosting. Luckily Mojang didn't keep these changes. So how do you creatively nerf the Elytra to be more balanced without taking the fun away? Well, as rocket boosting is a very fun mechanic, rather than removing its functionality, why not perhaps make it so that not any old firework can give you a boost, but specifically fireworks crafted with Dragon's Breath? You will always have access to the gliding mechanic of the Elytra, which is the passive boost reward for the first time you kill the Ender Dragon and go loot in then city. But if you want to get the full potential out of the Elytra, you can't just go to your fully automated sugarcane and creeper farm for infinite fireworks. You need to go to the end every now and again to get more, making the more powerful boosting an active effect which you need to work for. 
I choose Dragon's Breath as it is an already existing item with its own achievement, however its current uses are very lackluster. Like the Elytra, they both relate to the dragon, and you're more likely to obtain the breath after you have an Elytra, as opposed to normal fireworks which you can obtain easily before. Dragon's Breath is still a renewable material, but not necessarily as farmable as you need to complete the quest of bringing glass bottles to the end, respawn the Ender Dragon and collect its breath, before killing it again to reopen the portal and return home to acquire more. And when you run out, you need to go do it all over again. The biggest problem is for those who have or want to renovate the End Island, but worry about respawning the Ender Dragon as the dragon itself breaks blocks. But the solution could just be as simple as the dragon can only break block if it is the original one. As fireworks are no longer completely free to make, each one has a cost to use. Not much, but enough to not spam them all over the place. Using a few here and there, especially to save yourself from dangerous situations would be fine. But when you start to need a whole stack just to get from place to place that you visit regularly, the cost will add up and you'll start to incentivize possibly using a different form of transport. But if you do still want to use fireworks all the time, it just requires farming more dragon's breath. It all comes down to what the player chooses to do. I'm not changing any of the mechanics like making rockets slower, I'm just adding a well needed cost to balance the massive boost in power it provides. Another nerf which I think could be an interesting idea but does affect the mechanics is to have the elytra deactivate when you touch any liquid, because we all know that bees can't fly in rain, so why would the elytra be any different? You won't be able to use the elytra while underwater, which doesn't make sense anyways, and would give a good reason to be on guard while flying in the overworld, for if the sky turns grey and you aren't close enough to the ground to reach it before it starts to rain, that could be a long fall just waiting to happen. You would still be able to launch yourself up with Riptide by standing in a puddle of water and glide from there, but you won't be able to use the Elytra plus Riptide over and over again in the rain. Sure, it is one of the fastest forms of travel, but the only way to do it safely is to do it so high that you can't even see the terrain, if it has even loaded based on your speeds, leaving you with just a grey and blue screen, usually with the debug menu enabled to know where you are, which isn't really interesting gameplay. It would mean that it's safer to use the elytra in dry biomes where it doesn't rain, but otherwise it gives some possible downsides to the elytra to be able to give the other forms of transport a chance. If you were to also make it deactivate in lava, you would make the nether slightly more dangerous again, as you wouldn't be able to just fly out of a lava lake if you accidentally fell in, and if you are unprepared, could result in death again. Now. I wouldn't want to just nerf the elytra without giving the other forms of transport a buff to help bridge the gap between the two. To help give the different modes the boost they need, we need to look at what sort of situation they should be targeting and figure out why they aren't doing it justice. If the elytra should be shorter, quick activation and high mobility situations, what should the others do? First, looking at animals, I can confidently say that pigs are perfect. Moving on, in 1.6, the horse update, we got, you guessed it, horses. We also have donkeys, mules, llamas, striders, and more recently, the camel as rideable entities. The horse is supposed to be for adventures, being able to run quickly and jump high. It is supposed to be able to handle newly generated terrain as you explore for whatever it is you wish to find. However, there are three major and frequent obstacles that stop the horse in its tracks. Trees, water, and cliffs. Although they do work well in the plains, these obstacles come up far too often that it can be more effort than it's worth to take your horse with you. Now, what if while riding a horse, leaves acted more similarly to scaffolding, where although you can stand on top of it, you can enter the block from the sides and below. Horses would no longer get stuck on every tree they face and only be stopped by the trunks themselves. To still incentivize going through the plains when possible, however, the horse could just travel slower while inside a leaf block similar to powder snow, but at least trees would no longer be a complete roadblock. Horses have a swimming problem. It's not too bad when you cross a river where you can use a lead to pull the horse across or just meticulously push it across, but when you get a calling from the line where the sky meets the sea, it's not so easy to solve. 
apart from building a long bridge or traversing the nether which has its own problems, since you cannot put your horse into your pocket, your horse is effectively trapped on whatever island it spawned on. Up until recently, Bedrock Edition had the option to put them in a boat, but as players struggled to break the boat without hitting their horse, Mojang removed this feature, which I think is a mistake. Players could have used the relatively unknown mechanic of using a lead to get them out, but why not also work when using a fishing rod, or even better, when the player tries to jump while riding the horse? This would help horses immensely in using them to get from place to place. Another option could be to let horses benefit from boot enchantments like Death Strider or Frostwalker, either by using the enchants on your own boots or letting horse armor have enchants, but that's another whole can of worms. And for cliffs, just slowly climb down, water bucket down, or for the more sophisticated of you, slow fall your way down. Since the donkey and mule are based off the horse, where the donkey is slower but can have storage and the mule is in between, most things done to the horse would help them too. The strider is the lava boat and doesn't really need changes, and the llama stabs someone 37 times in the chest. We do not need to speak about the llama. The camel, however, has some missed potential. Although you can have your friend join you on your journey, that doesn't help when you don't have any friends to join you. One idea I have to fill this void is to allow villagers to join you by trading with them to gain their trust. Then by hopping on a camel, the villager will attempt to join you. Then later just try to trade with the villager again to tell it to get off. People have been asking for a better way to transport villagers for ages, and this seems like it has potential. Especially now as you might need to transport villagers from different biomes to complete your trading hall. Camels already only spawn inside desert villages, so it's not too far-fetched an idea. I think boats generally work okay, and everyone loves their ice paths in the nether, no matter how little sense it makes. The main thing to improve with boats is an easier way to get other entities in and out of it. But the minecart? When powered rails are used to transport redstone signals more commonly than minecarts, you know something is wrong. As the most expensive to set up, its payoff is usually just not worth it. Some very smart people figured out that you can make minecarts much faster by using curved rails and pistons, at the cost of being even more expensive and even worse to set up and fix, despite setups to automate the process. Minecarts and rail orientation can be messed up when placed, minecarts bump into each other when going around corners and can just derail completely when moving too quickly, which is why they're capped at the speed as they are now. The visuals are sometimes just wrong, Furnace minecarts just exist, and less important, spawner and command block minecarts just have their own problems. But the biggest problem of all, of course, is you just can't do sick jumps with them. To give copper more uses, why not add copper rails, where the oxidization of the rail indicates how fast the minecart can go, from very fast with new rails to much slower on oxidized rails. Use a downhill slope to build up speed until the max speed that rail will allow is reached, or why not use the furnace minecart to reach those speeds, making the furnace minecart more useful as again as it will be the main way to maintain these new speeds. You could give it a small inventory so that you can put a lot more fuel in it for long distances and use an activator rail to automatically turn it on and off. Use chains to link it to your minecart and potentially others so they don't disconnect along the way and to be able to make actual trains. It would also be nice to be able to right click rails with your hand or a special item to be able to rotate the rails between its possible rotations, much like a debug stick can to be able to have more control over the rail placement when placing a lot in close proximity. Hopefully, by giving nerfs to the elytra and buffs to the other forms of transport, it can create a more balanced and interesting playing field where each shines in its own area rather than having one mode of transport to do everything. I am going to start off by agreeing with the larger Minecraft community that the inventory needs an update. However, since I laugh in the face of danger, I do not agree with how the inventory needs to change. I firmly do not believe that the common suggestions of just add more rows or increase the stack size are good solutions at all. In fact, I believe that the inventory as it is right now is a pretty good size. 
Instead, what we are lacking are the tools to easily manage everything. People claim that as Minecraft has gotten older, the amount of obtainable blocks has bloated while the inventory size has not changed. I beg to differ. Minecraft's first inventory held a maximum of 36 stacks, a total of 2,304 items, although more realistically 2,000 when you leave some slots for your tools like sword and pickaxe. However, since 1.3 of the ender chest, 1.9 of the offhand and 1.11 of shulker boxes, your inventory can now hold up to 110,592 items, or more realistically 100,000 items, a total of 50 times more storage capacity. And that's before you consider the likes of donkeys and chess minecarts to carry more items with you wherever you go. So, what improvements do I think could be made? Currently, although the main inventory is 36 slots, your hotbar can only ever use 9 of them at a time. The rest is effectively a backpack. But what if each row of your inventory acted like its own hotbar? Then add some toggles such that when scrolling, instead of scrolling across your hotbar, you scroll through the different hotbars of your inventory, much like some rotating storage. So although the actual size of the inventory has not changed, it may feel like it got bigger as now you have easier access to all of it. One thing you can do with this is instead of having most of your hotbar taken up with all your different tools, leaving only just a few slots for blocks, you could dedicate that row for your tools and then scroll to the rows that have all your blocks when building. Or you could split your rows based on what you're doing, have a pickaxe and stone based blocks on one and an axe with wood based blocks on another row. Speaking of tools, I will have to admit that through the updates, they are the one thing that we have gotten more of that does actually take up more of our inventory. Currently, no one wants to use up one of their precious slots to hold a spyglass just for the off chance that they might use it, and it's usually too much effort to get out of a shulker box to bother with, so no one ends up even using it. However, a possible addition is to add some sort of tool belt, a new part of the inventory which can only hold unstackable items for those tools that we seldom use. The ones that we don't want taking up much of our main inventory, but still want quick access to when we want to use them. It would also give more reason to hold something like a smite sword on you to quickly switch between when out fighting mobs. Just also add tool trims to make it easier to differentiate between them all. Stuck in development hell lies the bundle which could be a great tool to handle lots of individual types of items. However, in its current form, it's not really easy to take particular items out of it apart from spewing everything onto the ground. It does, however, have a pretty nice UI to show what is inside, but trying to get this preview to work well on mobile is the roadblock that is keeping it from being added. If I were to implement the bundle, I would make it so that you could open it up like a chest but from inside the inventory. Since the bundle itself isn't an unstackable item, there would be no need to split stack, so right clicking it could open it up. From there you can move items in and out of it with much ease, just make sure to keep that one stack limit. Or perhaps make it three. Turning it into a semi chest could also be the solution that the mobile platform needs to overcome its roadblock. Then taking from the bundle, it would be nice for shulkers to have a similar UI to see its contents from inside the inventory rather than just the text that it is today. In version 1.21, Minecraft finally received the order crafter that has been requested for years, and it does work great. But that doesn't mean we could also improve the manual crafting experience. Crafting is literally in the name of the game. If you have ever played around with villagers, you might have learned that you can press base to be able to automatically input what you last traded to make bulk trading easier. So tell me, why can't you do the same with crafting instead of needing to click the crafting book every time? You can press Q on the output to automatically craft and drop the item simultaneously, but why not the whole stack at once? If you really wanted to increase the in inventory size, let the 2x2 crafting grid also become slots of the inventory, so you can more easily craft on the go, or store more items at the cost of not being able to craft without the table. 
it's just the little changes like this that would make the whole experience much more enjoyable, and perhaps make the inventory feel just a little more loved. Captain Jeb, mission report on the combat snapshots you were working on. Nothing to report, sir. Nothing? This is outrageous! It has been three years since the last one came out. I need them prompto. You may be on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. Push those combat snapshots to a full release, then we will talk. Okay, seriously, where have those combat snapshots gone? There are so many, both major and minor changes that would be so useful to have. Additions like having your loyalty trident return from the void, be able to hit enemies with a smaller hitbox with less issues, shorter cooldown times when missing your swing, stackable potions and so much more. Even if no further changes are added to them and they are just thrown in as is, I can already hear the shouts of joy across the world from both 1.8 and 1.9 PvPers alike. It's a gold mine just sitting there, collecting dust. Just add it. It will be super easy, barely an inconvenience. One combat change I would like to see that is not part of the current combat snapshots has to do with the Death Una Reverse card, the Totem of Undyne. Found only in the far corners of the world, inside the deadly woodland mansions, these totems were so powerful that it could even save those you loved from dying. However, they came at the cost of its rarity and difficulty to obtain. Even just holding one in your hand risked either using it or losing it, so you saved them for the times you really needed them, otherwise you were just wasting them. With your trusty steed and a map to guide the way, you set out on a quest to clear out the mansion and collect around three of these totems, with the hopes of turning your hardcore world into just a survival one. But then all that changed when the 1.14 nation attacked. The mansion was no longer the only way to get these totems, for there was a new supplier in town, the Raid. No longer did the player need to travel all the way to the mansion, as the pillager patrols could spawn near you, which could then trigger a raid right at your home, and if you reached a high enough wave, it spawned the totem wielding evokers with it. Now this alone wouldn't be too bad, if it wasn't for the fact that raids were not only repeatable, but farmable. No longer was a world limited in the amount of totems one could provide, for now players could collect as much as they desired, and if there was no cost to getting them, there was no cost to using them either. Gone were the days where your players weighed up whether they should hold a totem or not, for now everyone just holds one regardless of what they are doing, and if one does pop, no worries, just put another one in your infinite supply into your offhand. Death truly is no longer an option. Let's look at the other item that you might hold in your offhand before you get your hand on these powerful totems, the shield. With its ability to block incoming damage from in front of the player, it is still a pretty useful item, especially early game. However, unlike the totem, its effect is not active at all times. Instead, the player must choose to activate it by a holding right click and at the cost of its movement speed and the ability to attack. If the totem were to work like this too, then its power to cost ratio will be in the balance again. The totem will no longer be able to just automatically save you whenever something goes wrong, but it must be called upon for else it would not work. It would still be an item worth getting as its power to save is still there, it just means that death still has a chance to get you when you were least expecting it to. Although it would be nice to see a reason to go to the mansion again, perhaps the Illusioner could help take care of that. Speaking of death, let's now talk about the undead, more specifically the zombie villager. When killed by a zombie, a villager will die on easy or be zombified on hard. Originally when a villager was zombified, it would lose all of its memories about what profession it was and what trades it had. So on hard mode, your villagers had the potential to turn and attack you, but if you had the right resources, you had the potential to save them so you didn't need to collect new villagers from scratch, and those that you did save gave you a discount on its new trades. 
However, this all changed in yet again 1.14, where villagers now remember their trades through the zombification process. Due to the discount mechanic, it then became incentivized to purposely zombify and cure your villagers for a discount. And up until recently, you could even stack this discount for even cheaper trades. This one mechanic is one of the large reasons why people claim that hard mode is actually the easiest mode. Since villagers are the most humanoid mob, and forcing them into zombies just for your benefit is not very humane nor balanced, I would either have the large discount only be applied the first time they are cured, then diminish over time, or perhaps flip the difficulties so that easy mode players can enjoy the large discounts but if playing in hard mode and you let a zombie reach the villagers? Say goodbye to your friends, because mistakes should have consequences. I am still a believer that with the right overhaul, the mob everyone hates, the monster of the night sky, the phantom, can be redeemed. A few key changes to their behaviour could be the difference between players disabling them or not. With regard to their spawning, Make them check the light level of the ground below where they spawn, so that light in the area does in fact stop them. And since they don't like cats, if a cat is nearby, don't let them spawn either. Have the counter only increase when the player is in the overworld, since the nether and end don't have a day-night cycle, and for the technical player's sake, make them part of the general mob cap, so that the mob switches can outright disable them. Apply some easing to the path the phantom takes to make its movement not so jerky so it is easier to tell where it is going and therefore easier to hit. Have them start passive and get more aggressive the longer you don't sleep, and possibly utilise the size tag to make them more interesting. Make sure they don't apply knockback, and when dawn comes, just have them dive into the ground terraria boss style rather than having to deal with flaming phantoms. And since the membranes could have some use with the new anvil changes as you might prefer longer lasting elytra over automatically repairing ones, the last change needs to be to change their scream to something which doesn't make me want to rip my ears off. There exists an interesting mechanic where if a creeper explodes while under a potion effect, it creates a lingering cloud effect with that same effect. But it is so extremely unknown because there is almost no reason for a creeper to ever have an effect during normal gameplay. Taking from hard mode spiders, what if other mobs were also able to spawn with these potion effects? Imagine a zombie with jump boost or a creeper with swiftness. Make it tied to the Y level so that the deeper you go, the more likely for these mobs to appear to give the idea that the more you descend, the harder it gets. One other addition I think could be cool to see has to do with the new armor trims. Because the price needed to apply them effectively requires diamonds if you want to keep the template, there is a high chance that you won't be applying trims to anything below diamond armor. One way to add trims to lower level gear is to take the armor that can be naturally generated on hostile mobs and give those a small chance to come with any trim with any material. Like how people collected chainmail armor before you could just buy it from villagers, it would give a new reason to want to collect mob armor again. Also, please make the templates have a broken form that can be fixed instead of just breaking as newer players might not know how to duplicate them first and then have no template to copy anymore. And for those that play on peaceful, hostile mobs could be added, but just make them passive like shulkers so that they can enjoy their loot and have a chance to actually finish the game. Another one of the most commonly requested updates is to do another revamp of the end dimension. Although I think there is a lot of potential here, until then, there are some small changes that the end could greatly benefit from. I know that the end is supposed to have this dead vibe to it, but there is a difference between something feeling dead and something just feeling boring. When the end is just completely flat, and all you do in it is wander around aimlessly hoping to come across a city, only to when you do know exactly where all the loot is, especially once you have your first elytra, there is little more challenge that the end provides, especially when you realise that the end is the only place where you can just stop anywhere, look down, and be completely safe. 
If all the different floating islands were to be at different Y levels, it would give more depth, literally, to the end without taking away from its desolate nature. Exploring the end both on foot and with the elytra would be more interesting and would help the end cities not stick out like a sore thumb as much. The end cities would still be quite easy to spot, but still only within certain render distance, which is a silly problem as almost nothing else in the game is limited by render distance quite as much. If we increase the render distance with the use of a mod like Distant Horizons, you can see it's not much more of a problem. Since Eyes of Ender have little use now that you are in the end, what if while there, they now pointed towards the nearest city, so you no longer needed to aimlessly wander until the city just happens to be there? The cities themselves could have some minor changes, i.e. the move the chest to the centre of the rooms, since although Minecraft encourages using your knowledge of the game to best it, being able to cheese all the loot without even interacting with the shulkers, I think takes things a little too far especially for the structure that gives some of the best loot in the game. Moving to the overworld, I remember when I first heard about Amplified Terrain and being so mesmerised that I searched and searched to try and find some Amplified Terrain in my own world to build a base in, only to find out later that it was a completely separate world type. Sure, now we have the Shattered Savannah, but it just isn't the same. Why can't Amplified be a rare biome to find, especially with the new world height? It would be amazing to live in. And why not have the sinkholes from 1.18, monoliths from Alpha, or other interesting phenomena be rare bits of geography to stumble across? Knowing stuff like this is out there, somewhere, gives me a reason to explore, when I know that there is something different to what I have seen hundreds of times before. And of things I have seen hundreds of times before, Let's talk about structures, and how common some of them are. Create a new world around the release of Minecraft, and it's just you against the vast and empty world. You might cr come across the odd dungeon or abandoned mineshaft underground, but otherwise you were the sole owner of this isolating world. As the updates passed and new structures were added, the world became more populated. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but when you can't start a new world and not immediately come across a shipwreck, a village or two, underwater ruins and more, the world no longer feels like yours to do whatever with, but one that you've arrived late to and is already filled with its own inhabitants. When you have issues with two or more structures overlapping in ways that shouldn't make sense, it starts to take you out of the world. Has anyone actually bought an Ocean Explorer map because they haven't somehow already looted five of these eyesores by this point? There is filling up a world, but there should be a limit. Underground structures and rare structures like the mansion work great, but there are some that need to be dialed back in terms of how common they are. One small change to an existing structure I would love to see, as we reach the changes more personal to me, is with the abandoned village. You see, the zombie horse already exists within the Minecraft's code and can be spawned in creative mode, but it does not currently spawn naturally in survival. So why not replace the horses in abandoned villages with zombie horses, like it replaces the villager with its zombified versions? Or perhaps you can make them spawn as part of the village attacking the zombie siege. It won't affect much, as they would still be very rare, but it would give us something new to find and show off to our friends. Personally, I would love to see the Green Axolotl. It was right there in the trailer, so why is it not in the game? I feel like I've been tricked, bagstabbed, and quite possibly bamboozled. Keeping in line with not having green insert thing here, why isn't there an Azalea wood set? It was the perfect opportunity to add a green wood type to the game, but it would appear that there was just another missed opportunity for greatness alongside having Amethyst be a new note block instrument so that we could have control over its sweet sound and play a beautiful melody with it. I would also love to see some bedrock mechanics added to Java. I'm going to skip over the whole movable block entity since I'm sure you've heard that request many times and focus on snow and cauldrons. In bedrock, when snow is above leaves, it can turn them white, and snow can exist in the same block as flowers and such 
making it a truly white forest. And when the block below the snow is broken, it falls down and can stack on top of existing flow. It's such a nice addition. Also in Bedrock, not only can cauldrons hold water, lava and powder snow, but dyed water and potions too, which can also generate in the witch huts. You can use the dyed water cauldrons in order to dye your leather gear and the potion ones to tip your arrows in a much more interesting way, especially since Dragon's Breath will have a far better use if we add the new fireworks. And finally, and most importantly, please revert the one game tick copper bulb change for all us redstoners sake. Look, you might not agree with every single one of these changes, but I hope that you can see where I'm coming from. Some of these changes I am almost sure will spark some initial backlash. Others have already been made into mods. But if we want the game to last as long as Mojang does, then we need to take a few hits now so that we can enjoy the game later or let those after us enjoy it too. Why bother even adding a new transport system when it will never have the chance against the Elytra? Unless you make it even more powerful and introduce more power creep that will be even harder to fix later. When players get into the habit of spending hours grinding, trading, building farms and such just to become as powerful as possible because the current design of the game can encourage that, it creates a mindset in those players that Minecraft is just a game to beat and not played with. And so they complain that there is nothing else to do when they run out of extrinsic motivation rather than using their own intrinsic motivation to be creative and craft their own fun. I don't like Minecraft. I love it. And if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be making this very long video, would I? Minecraft has been the game of my life, with more hours of playtime than I can possibly count across many different worlds, both single player and multiplayer. And although I may not have the time to play it as much as I used to, I still care very much for it and want to see it continue to evolve and succeed. So if you do like the ideas I've put forward, please leave a like, talk about it in the comments below, share this video around, discuss these ideas with your friends. It would truly mean the world to me. For this is all just one small step for Steve. But it is also one giant leap for Steve Kind.
It's drifting nervous today. It's been a journey, but we're not on our way. Nabu machine, it's drifting nervous today. It's been a journey, but we're not on our way. There's a long way to go. We're not treading on. Problems to solve. This is the goal. A long way to go. We're not running on. Problems to solve. Music is to 